All of us are in the process of becoming. The only question is, who are you becoming? And I honestly kind of hope this series has demystified the answer to that question a little bit because in all honesty, you in the future is not really a question mark. You in the future is more of an equal sign. You 10 years from now is simply gonna equal the sum total of all of your decisions and thoughts and prayers and beliefs. The future you, to put it simple, will not be an accident, it'll be entirely evident. You will get to where you're going to one step at a time. You ever get to the end of a day that you just mailed in from the get-go? Hit the snooze button like four times, wake up tired and in a hurry, no time to brush your teeth, lucky charms for breakfast, forget working out, let's just call it another recovery day. I need to let my muscles breathe a little bit. Stop at Starbucks on the way to work for a venti mocha milkshake that you pretend is coffee. Somebody feels so attacked right now. 90 minutes of scrolling all before lunchtime. Worry about everything, pray about nothing, fast food for dinner, binge watch half a season, crawl in bed and log 30 more minutes of scrolling just to make sure your brain is restless before sleeping. Weird dreams all night because you had a snack at 11 p.m. and you wake up the next morning exhausted thinking, why do I always feel so bad? I am sick and tired of always feeling sick and tired. Why am I so exhausted? Oh, what a perplexing question mark my life is. Or is it more of an equal sign? Because I think if we're honest, we know a little bit too well about how we got here and how we'll get there. And that's why I hope this series has given you some vision for what God sees about the future you. Because with Jesus, listen to me, you will never be more forgiven than you are right now. But also with Jesus, you have only begun the process of becoming. Philippians 1.6 says this, being confident of this. Somebody say confident. confident. With some confidence, I like that. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will also carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. This message is called Face the Future with Confidence. Confidence. You can't tell me there's no confidence in you because the same power that raised Christ from the grave is alive and at work within you. He has not given you a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. To me, that sounds a lot like the ingredients for confidence. I think confidence has everything to do with simply realizing what is already true about you. I'm confident that God began the good work, and I've got this God assurance about where he is taking me, so I have every reason to face the future with confidence. So Holy Spirit, help us get our confidence back today. It's not in the flesh, it's in the spirit at work within us. Awake our souls in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, let's do something fun. Participation exercise. I want you to imagine for a second that Red Rocks Church is gonna pay for a one-week, all-inclusive vacation for you to go on anywhere in the world, any city, any country, and you get to go by yourself just when you thought this couldn't get any better. <laughs> anywhere in the world. I mean, it could be the Bahamas, it could be Bora Bora, it could be Boulder, I don't care. You dream big, boys and girls. Anywhere in the entire world. You got your place? Oh, and did I mention this theoretical scenario is gonna fly you first class? And did I mention this hypothetical situation is gonna put you up in a top floor villa at the hotel of your choosing? My, gener my, my imagination is so generous towards you guys. <laughs> All right, on the count of three, we're gonna yell out your answers. Every location, wherever you are with confidence, yell out your answer. One, two, three. <laughs> Maui. Florida, did somebody, did you say Florida, Connor? Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland, yes. <laughs> you got a deal. All right, at every campus, check under your chairs for a golden ticket right now. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm sorry. I actually tried to get Andrew to pony up and pay for this, but he called it bad stewardship. Totally dropped the God card on me. I'm as mad as you, maybe madder. 
Are we all mad at Andrew together right now? I feel like it's just our church against Andrew Matrone at the moment, don't you? Hey, it is fun to think about, but here's the thing. As much as you might want that trip, with all my heart, I believe today we're talking about something that if you're honest, you want even more, and it's confidence. Confidence. My working definition of confidence is this, a soul conviction about God's goodness in your life and his intentions for your future. Confidence is something that is more desired than even a a dream vacation because if you're anything like me, confidence either makes your day or insecurities will break your day. Because my spirit man is confident, it is so confident, but my flesh is insecure. I told our team in Austin this last Sunday. Every Sunday morning when I drive to our four-year-old church in Austin, I have, to, I have to tell my spirit to wake up and I have to tell my flesh to shut up. I, I really do. I have to remind myself this whole church was God's idea in the first place, not mine, and that means the outcome is on him. It's in my weakness that, that he is made strong, and, and the dream is difficult by design, so I rely more on his abilities than mine, and if he's got me, then I've got this, and I just want to say the same thing to you today. I, I don't know you or the season you're in or what your this is, but I know that God's got you, and if God's got you then you've got this. You can raise these kids. You are a good mom. You've got this. You are a good dad. You've got this. Maybe you're stepping out into a new season, looking for a new job, just started that company, putting your heart back on the line after it was broken for the very first time, signed up for a dating app. Maybe you're doing counseling to try to heal your marriage. Maybe you're going through FPU with $100,000 in debt. Maybe you're leading your very first group. If God's got you, then you've got this. So don't let your faith hesitate. Dream even bigger, leave even, live even better, sleep even deeper. Because if God's got you, then you've got every reason to face the future with confidence. I think Matthew 14 is basically a masterclass in confidence. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it starts with Jesus feeding 5,000 people by multiplying one little kid's fish sandwich to right after that, doing this in verses 22 through 23. Let's read it. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And don't picture Chatfield Reservoir, all right? This is the Sea of Galilee, and a storm is rolling in. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, some translations will say, the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, because why not? Why walk around it when you can walk on it? When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, They were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come on, said Jesus. As much as I love Peter's question, I love Jesus' response even more. Yeah, okay. Be careful what you pray for. God might just say yes to you. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, that's a word for somebody today. You're gonna cry out to God for help. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Amen. Amen. I see Jesus and Peter as kind of like a dynamic duo. And obviously, Jesus is Batman and Peter is, is Robin. 
And obviously, saying that's downplaying the difference between these two men is the understatement of the century. I understand that. Jesus is the galaxy-designing, universe-owning, death-conquering son of the living God, and Peter can fish. (laughs) Which turns out to be no small thing. But I see these guys as the dynamic duo that can teach us a thing or two about facing the future with confidence. Because if you're gonna face the future with some confidence, the first thing you need to do is exactly what Peter did that night, and it's this, focus on Jesus. Because you will move towards whatever it is that you're focused on. Golfers, we know this better than anybody else. There is a big difference between focusing on the fairway and focusing on not shanking it into the woods. If all you're focused on is not hitting your Pro V1 into the lake, then do yourself a favor and pick up your golf ball, tee it up in the drop zone because you will move towards whatever it is that you focus on. So before we give Peter all the attention in this story, let's focus on what Jesus is doing. Verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. So he, he makes the disciples get into the boat and row to the other side of the lake while he climbs a mountain by himself to pray and wait for the storm to roll in. Now I'm not saying that God schedules the storms in your life. But I am saying he knows about them, he expects them, and he uses them. That your diagnosis did not surprise him, your layoff did not catch him off guard. In fact, you wanna know what I learned from a Holy Lands professor this week? I learned that the sea the disciples were struggling in was visible from the very spot on the mountain that Jesus was praying from. Just because you can't see God doesn't mean God can't see you. In fact, go read Romans 8, 34 later. It says, right now in real time, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God watching over you and interceding for you. And maybe the reason he often waits until the fourth watch of the night before he shows up is because he's more committed to your calling than your comfort. I've heard it said as Christians, we often associate Christ with comfort and the devil with disruption. When in reality, it might just be the devil trying to keep you you nice and comfy, and it's probably Jesus who's trying to interrupt your life and get you to come walk with him on a lake in a storm to get out of your your boat. And maybe he's waiting until the fourth watch of the night because he's trying to forge some fourth watch kind of faith in your heart. He might just be setting you up for the story of a lifetime focused on Jesus. And take note that before performing a miracle, Jesus prepares for it. That's the reason you start your year with a fast. That's the power of beginning your day with prayer. Because even Jesus had to get ready before he walked on water. Prepare yourself in the presence of God. Prepare yourself in the presence of God. And while everybody else is rowing through life, struggling and striving out of their own strength to find out what they can do, you are getting yourself ready to find out what God can do through you. Because it took the disciples nine hours of struggling to get to the same exact place it took Jesus nine minutes of stepping. I'm telling you, when you start to just focus on Jesus, you start giving him more and more of the hidden parts of your life that you were withholding before. You start doing things his way. You start giving Jesus your first fruits instead of your leftovers, the best part of your time, the best part of your day, the first 10% of your paycheck, not the last two. To say, oh God, God, you can have the best of me. Let's do this your way. I'm sticking with you. At first, it might feel like the rest of the world is hustling on ahead of you and maybe even feel like you're missing your season, but it will only feel that way. Because when you have the God factor that only comes from being in this God's presence, you will find yourself striding to where everybody else has been striving to. It's called the the favor of his presence. Picture like almost a, a moving sidewalk on your journey to becoming the future you. 
You don't just wanna know what you can do. I don't, I've already found that out. I wanna know what God can do through me. The future you, don't struggle there by yourself when you can step there with the God who made the universe. Because trust me, when you get into the deep waters of God's calling on your life, you don't just wanna get there. You also need to be able to walk there. And confidence comes not from the flesh, but from the favor of the, the God who allows us to stand where most people sink. God's got you, and that means you've got this. Focus on the Jesus who's walking with you, who will immediately catch you if you need him to, and face the future with confidence, amen? amen. And act like a leader. Act like a leader. We see this in Peter, because everything rises and falls on leadership. I think it was Andy Stanley who said, the most difficult and challenging person for you to lead is you. You ought to know you attempted every single day and you were there for every bad decision you ever made. But today, I just wanna talk to you like you already are a leader because I believe the future you is and God sees you that way now. So whether you're a mom or a dad or a big brother or a big sister or, or a nurse or a boss or an intern or a friend, followers of Christ are leaders of people. So lead yourself to face the future with confidence. When Peter sees Jesus, he says this in verse 28. Lord, if it's you then tell me to come to you on the water. Come on. And notice he didn't say, come on, Peter. Jesus just said, come on. I think God wanted 13 guys walking on the water that night. Only one got out. And I go, man, come on, church. Like, I think our world needs some inspiration from Christians right now. Not, not instruction, not opinions inspiration from Christians right now when everybody, everyone is uneasy about the future and everybody is terrified about something that's around the corner, for the world to be able to look at Christians who are acting like leaders who say, hey, this is what it looks like to live your life outside of the boat. This is what it looks like to trust in the God of the universe who's got you. If he's got me, then I've got this. We don't have a safe God, we never have. We have a good God, and he's the kind of father who loves when his kids do dangerous things carefully. He's the kind of dad who loves when his kids Walk on lakes and storms. Face the future with confidence. I see three self-leadership principles in verse 30 alone. Look at this. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water towards Jesus. So number one, lead your feet. But when he saw the wind, lead your eyes. He was afraid, lead your heart. Lead your feet to Jesus regardless of where Jesus is. It was about 10 years ago at LAX, I was leaving with a few friends on a year-long trip around the world to do mission work in some not-so-safe places, and my mom said this to me at the airport. Imagine a mother saying this to her child who's leaving for an entire year. She said, I trust this because the safest place to be is wherever the will of God is on your life, whether that's here or the other side of the world or on a lake in a storm, you just, you wanna be wherever Jesus is. That's what Peter got right. He got out of the boat because he wanted to be where Jesus was. Well, what if I get out of the boat and then the storm starts to sink me? Well, then the water walking God who's next to you will immediately catch you and it'll be one heck of a story. Here's a, here's a better question. What if you don't get out and the rickety little lifeboat you stayed in sinks? I mean, that boat, we're not talking the Royal Caribbean Symphony of the Seas here. I'm fairly confident if Jesus doesn't calm the storm, this thing's going down in a matter of 30 minutes or less. Peter chose God's sovereignty over man-made security. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I just, I don't think you got anything to lose, man. 
Life is short. Storms are real. So is heaven. Lead your feet to Jesus. Make motion in your life because God can't steer a parked car and he also didn't save you so you could stay where you are. Lead your feet to him. Make motion in your faith. Go to a welcome party. You've been watching online forever. Come back to an in-person service. Start a Bible reading plan. Join a group. Start giving consistently and see what God does in your life. Get baptized this May. Lead your feet. Make motion to Jesus, and let me push you in your faith, especially if you've been coming here for a while, but you're not necessarily walking in step with Jesus. You're watching from your boat others walk in step with Jesus. Listen to me. In your faith, are you yourself moving towards God, or are you standing on a move of God? Because that can feel like I'm moving. Are you leading your feet? Are you leading your eyes? Number two, picture Peter walking on water. At some point, Pete's on the water and he makes this transition right here. At first, he is concentrating on his savior and he is considering the storm. And by the way, consider the storm. That's called wisdom. But at some point, the waves and the winds pick up and Peter changes from concentrating on Jesus and considering the storm to now he's concentrating on the storm and he's considering Jesus and that is when he starts sinking. Are you focused on Jesus and considering the news right now? Or are you just hyper fixated on the news and every once in a while considering Jesus and wondering why it feels like you're sinking in anxiety and fear? I'm telling you, lead your eyes because the faith God has put in your heart, it is realism and optimism at the same time. Faith allows you to face the stormy facts of today and faith allows you to face forward to a victorious future that Jesus has for you tomorrow. Consider the wind. Consider the waves, consider the world, but concentrate on the word and lead your heart, number three, to him. Because you, wa- you, got, you got water walking blood in your veins. And your God's got miracles in the making. That verse, deep calls to deep, we quote all the time. Not sure many of us know what it means, myself included. I'll take a shot at it. On surface level, you wanna stay in your boat. But if you pay attention long enough to something deeper, you wanna get out of it more. It's like the depths of God are calling to the depths of a future you that understands you're actually not made for the road most traveled. And with God, his way is rarely the easy way but he's got you, and that means you've got this. Focus on Jesus, act like a leader, and charge the storm. Verses 27 through 29, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, then tell me to come to you on the water. Come on, he said. And then Peter, who, by the way, is not necessarily the most confident guy in the world yet, makes a very confident decision. You want more confidence, just start making the decisions the confident version of you would make. I bet you confidence will catch up to you. That's what Peter did. He gets out of the boat, you guys, and goes for a walk on the lake. So here's my transition. Did you know that cows and buffalo can both smell storms? I didn't have another transition, so that was it. This is true of all herd animals. We're talking specifically cows and buffalo. They can both smell storms coming. But cows and buffalo react and respond to those storms in very, very, very different ways. Cows, like all other herd animals besides buffalo, run from the storms. And you've seen cows. Cows, you know, like, you're not outrunning that storm, but they sure try. Buffalo 
do something different. Buffalo are set apart. When they smell storms, buffaloes charge into them head on. And shout out to Coach Prime in the CU Buffs 2023 football season. <laughs> Victory in Jesus' name. Cows get just as wet as buffaloes do. They can't outrun the storm, they try, and all they do is prolong their dread and delay their lives. But when storms come, the buffalo mentality is to charge straight into it. Storms of life are real, inevitable, they're coming. Two ways to get through a storm, as a survivor and an overcomer, you're the latter. You might not be faster than it, you are stronger than it. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Come on, how good is that verse? Don't be, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, a sound mind and confidence. And I will go before you, but I won't go for you. Charge the storm. I made a new friend last month. She was diagnosed with lung cancer three years ago. And she has been just charging that storm like a buffalo, man. I mean, lifestyle changes, exercise changes. She has kicked bad habits. She dropped an addiction. She told me she hasn't had a gram of processed sugar, gluten, or dairy in three years. I said, that, how? <laughs> That's crazy. How do you do that? And I'll never forget what she said. You'd be amazed at what you can do when you have to. Wake up calls wake you up and you realize the reservoir of grit and godliness that's already in you. I guess the question is, can you wake up before the wake up call? I recently tried to project a couple decades into the future for my life to see the future you that God sees when he looks at me and considering a few patterns and specifically some medication patterns that for the last 10 years have done some damage. And I was like, man, if I keep going, like I have a wake up call in my future. But in the absence of a crisis and without a diagnosis, I guess, can you wake up without a wake up call? Sir Isaac Newton, objects at rest want to stay at rest. That includes humans. Until something forces us to move, the question is, can you charge the storm before it catches you? I talked to a young lady recently in a pastoral meeting who had been in a two year long relationship and just sensing a breakup coming and she was terrified of the heartbreak and terrified of the storm that was in front of her. And I asked her this question, I said, if I had an easy button right here on the coffee table between you and me, and if you hit that easy button, it would transport you three months into the future, past all the hard conversations, through all the pain, would you push it? And without, without hesitation, she said, absolutely. And I said, that answer should shout to you. If you would press an easy button to get from here to there, then it's time to charge the storm that's standing in between here and there. It's showing up to work knowing you have a difficult conversation. It's the difference between charging it at 9 a.m. and putting it off until 4.45. All you do is just, you let that, that dread linger all day and you just delay the entire day because that's all you're thinking about. You've been running from rehab for years and all you're doing is postponing your purpose, that's it. But the spirit of a buffalo is to have the conversation, make the change, make the decision. You can smell the storm, and if you wait for it to sink your boat, you will find out that you can swim. But if you get out of it now, you will find out that you can walk. Yeah. If God is for you, no storm can stand against you. And if he's got you, then you've got this. Charge the storm. Amen? and endure till the good part. 
Somebody recently said to me, it might have been Corey, I can't remember, but he said, dude, got this new TV show, it's gonna change your life. You have to watch it, but you got to endure until the good part. Have you ever said this to somebody or been told this? And I said, hey, well, when's that? When's the good part? He said, about halfway through season two. I said, season two? How much time does everybody have? Am I taking crazy, but like season two? He said, dude, trust me. You gotta endure till the good part. If you're in a storm, I'm so humbled to get to be the messenger right here. God wanted me to tell you there is something on the other side worth going through this storm for. And I know it's dark, and I know it's hard, and I can't imagine the pain, and I can't imagine the stress, but, but to quote Pastor Stephen Furtick, if you don't endure through the dark part, you won't get to the good part. I'm not sure who I'm talking to. Maybe you just got a diagnosis, or somebody you love just got the diagnosis. Maybe you're in the middle of heartbreak. Maybe you're in the middle of the unknown right now, or you just got laid off, or... You just had a falling out with somebody very important to you. Maybe you're contemplating suicide right now because you just can't imagine continuing to live if life is this hard and you just gotta, you gotta hear me shout this to you. It's not gonna feel this way forever. It's not gonna feel this way forever, man. Spring comes after winter every year. Storms are dark. None of them are permanent. You gotta endure. You gotta live. You got more in you than you know. God is forging a fourth watch kind of faith in your heart and even when you can't see him, he's got his eyes on you. You gotta endure. You gotta be confident that the one who began the good work in you is the same God who will take it to completion because in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you haven't seen the best part of your life yet. You haven't met the future you. You gotta endure till the good part. And, and I'm not trying to give cold comfort out of ignorance of the reality of your situation. Trust me, I've, I'm not trying to give you cheap tricks or kitschy phrases that don't actually work. I've been on the receiving end of that. That's not my, I just, I want you to find out firsthand what Peter found out at 4 a.m. on the Sea of Galilee. That when oceans rise and where feet may fail, you have an opportunity to go for a walk with your Savior on the water in a storm. And nothing will change your faith and bring you closer to the future you you dream about more than that. Amen. Red Rocks, will you stand? First Peter 5, 10 through 11. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen, 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 amen. And by the way, who wrote that? Peter. You got goodness ahead of you. Even if you're 95, when you consider eternity, the best is still yet to come in your life. When you live with forever in mind, you walk more in the fullness of it today. Heaven is not just some coping mechanism that helps us deal with the pain of losing loved ones. Heaven is, heaven is not just some crutch that allows you to, to feel better about the fact that there's coming a day where you will take your last breath. Heaven is more real and more familiar than we'll ever know this side of eternity. You got an eternity of good parts in front of you. Endure until it, because there is coming a day where there will be no more pain and no more disease and no more cancer and no more tears and no more loneliness and no more longing where it will truly be 
just us together with God on a new earth paradise of fullness and purpose and love and belonging. And it's real. And we get a sneak peek of it when Jesus and Peter get back into the boat and all the eyes go straight to the Son of God who just defied the laws of the very nature he created. They start worshiping him, the same Jesus who just about a month after that would set his face towards Jerusalem, fully knowing what's waiting for him in Jerusalem. Jesus fully knowing there's a crucifixion right around the corner, fully knowing there is a storm to charge and pain to endure, even though Peter tries to talk him out of it. And even though in moments of his weakness and humanity, we see he doesn't really wanna go through with it. Luke 9:51 says, when the days drew near for him being Jesus to be taken up, he set his, what's that word? His face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face towards Jerusalem. He set his face with confidence towards an unknown future. And he focused on his heavenly father. And he acted like the leader of all leaders and charged into the storm of all storms. And for the joy set before him, for the eternity of good parts with us in heaven in front of him, he endured. You're made in his image. And if that God's got you, then I promise you, you've got this. And you have every reason to face the future with confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. Red Rocks, let's worship.